Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for our Insulation Intel webinar, John's Manville Building Insulation Products. I'm Rachel Hunt, and I'll be your moderator for today's presentation. Before we dive into introductions, I'd like to go over a few logistics. So to start, some of us are working from home, and with that, there's some technical difficulties that might happen. If something does come up during the event, we'll do our best to troubleshoot. And if for some reason we're unable to solve any of the troubleshooting issues, we will record the webinar and send it out um, next week. Next, if you have any questions or concerns throughout the webinar, you may submit them at any point during the presentation via the Q&A feature. We will address these questions live at the end of the presentation. If you don't see the Q&A screen, look to the right and there is a drop down option. Um, it will open up a menu and it'll open the dialog box to submit any questions, again, at the right of your screen. And a quick note before we get started, this webinar is for educational purposes only and should not be used as a substitute for professional engineering design, consultation, or documentation that may be required by building codes, contracts, or applicable by law. If you have any questions after the webinar, you can refer to our specific application guidelines and instructions located in the product section of our website. Additionally, we will follow the webinar today with a survey. This is your opportunity to provide us with feedback on how we did today, ask any additional questions you may have about the topic, or suggest new topics for future webinars. This survey is also part of how we deliver the JAM experience to you. The JAM experience is based on four pillars of the JAM culture listed on the bottom left corner of the slide. We believe it's critical to make sure that we hear, understand, and respond to your needs in order to deliver the best interaction to you. We offer webinars like this one to help educate the market and offer a tool and resource for you and your business, but we understand that this isn't just a one-way street. Your feedback is a key component to helping us evolve to better meet your needs. So if you have any comments or suggestions about how we can better accomplish this, or even if you feel like we missed the mark today, we encourage you to fill out the survey. And we use this feedback to improve our webinars and provide the information that has the most value to you. Also, we are frequently asked whether or not we send out the presentations upon their conclusion. While we do not send out the presentation itself, we do post a recording of it online for you to watch at your leisure or share with your colleagues. And this ensures that you can have the presentation within its full context. So um, we'll send you an email next week once it's live on our website. And again, you're able to access that on jm.com. Um, with that, let's get into some introductions. Joining me today are Tom Calcevera, Eric Dake, and Brian Verscore, and I'm going to over, um, hand it over to Tom to introduce himself. Thank you, Rachel. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Tom Calcevera. I'm the Senior Manager of Technical Services, and I've been with Johns Manville for 35 years. I'd like to give you a minute to jot down my contact information, my email, my phone number, if you have any questions like you want to shoot over to me directly. So let's just wait a second, Rachel, and then move on to Eric. Hello, everyone. I'm Eric Dake. I've been with Johns Manville for 19 years, and I am currently the senior product manager for our blowing wool, mineral wool, and polyiso continuous insulation product lines. Hello everyone, I'm Brian Verscore. I've been with Vanville for only 15 years, but uh, probably got around a century of family experience rolling around in fiberglass. All right, with that, let's go ahead and uh, start off with the agenda. Um, we're gonna start with a brief discussion around the, the considerations when selecting the right insulation for your project, then we'll move into discussing uh, our specific products that we offer, including key properties, uh, sizes, R values, et cetera. And finally, we'll finish off with uh, introducing our remarkable Tech Connect team and the wonderful resources that they offer. So 
So for considerations, when, when you're looking for the right insulation for your product, project, the primary consideration often is, is uh, the ability to control heat loss or gain. Uh, that's the primary role that you have is for temperature control inside of your building. Um, however, the building or region the building's in, you may be interested in other properties like vapor transmission, precipitation, airflow, and sound. Um, depending on the installation product, you may control these items um, without the additional requirements like a vapor barrier. So for instance, spray foam, polyiso, uh, craft, craft face fiberglass, there's, there's several options where you wouldn't have to add a, a separate vapor barrier. Um, Curtain wall, mineral wool can behave as a drainage barrier to protect against precipitation. Two other items considered uh, you know, are sound control and fire resistance. Uh, and as we go through the presentation, you'll gain an understanding of how JM's insulation portfolio covers all of these considerations for you. So first up is, is fiberglass. So um, the primary driver for your choice of insulation, uh, fiberglass insulation, is the R value that you need to achieve given your cavity and, and the code requirements. The R value is a function of the measured thermal conductivity and, and then the thickness of the product. So while this is just a small snapshot of the R values we offer, um, the intent was to give you an idea that you can increase your R value first by increasing your thickness um, while switching from a wall cavity to a floor ceiling cavity, for example you inherently have a deeper cavity, which can allow a thicker product to obtain a higher R value. Conversely, if you, are, if you desire or are required by code to have a higher R value but are constrained by your cavity depth, uh, here's where the higher density products come to the rescue. By combining these two levers, you can achieve whatever R value your application or, or code requires. So residential versus commercial applications, uh, we do both. Generally speaking, in your residential applications, wood-framed housing, you're going to have wall studs that are 16-inch on center. Um, so you'll, you'll use a 15-inch um, bat for that that's friction fit, that fits in between the studs and, uh, and doesn't require anything to hold itself in place. Um, additionally, in the ceiling, um, you have the same type of a scenario with a 24-inch um, on center. And, uh, and a 23-inch insulation product. When you move over to the commercial segment, you're going to have 16-inch uh, face is kind of how they measure that for the steel studs. So you'll actually put a 16-inch bat in there. And then for the ceiling applications, 24, you use a 24-inch bat. Those are the main, you know, kind of differentials between uh, residential and, and commercial. Uh, first up is our unfazed product. Um, <coughs> it's you can create a vapor barrier using polyfilm if you need it in your application um, over the wall face prior to drywalling, um, and we'll offer all the necessary R values to either comply or exceed uh, local codes or desires from the building or, or homeowner um, in various dimensions. Next up is our craft face bats. Um, this is paper facing, and it's ideal for, um, you know, forming a vapor barrier. Uh, you may not leave this exposed, though. Most of the time, it's going to go underneath your drywall, um, and it can be uh, used in, in di various different construction types in both residential and commercial applications. Foil face uh, is mostly used in, in commercial, but you can uh, you could potentially use it in, in residential if you desired. Uh, but it's, uh, it's faced with a foil uh, facing, and it's ideal for mo moisture control. This will not be left exposed um, and, and well, not allowed to be left exposed. And again, various R values in the offering and, and sizes that will fit and you need. Um, FSK, so this is the similar to the foil-faced offering, but uh, does meet a 2550 flame spread and smoke developed, so it could be left exposed where, where codes permit. It is also a vapor barrier can be used in all the, all the various construction types and uh, comes in the plethora of R values and, and widths and lengths to conform for uh, whatever your application may be. Comfort Therm, so this is our, our poly-encapsulated bat. Um, the entire bat is encapsulated with a film. Um, it is available both with a vapor barrier or perforated, which would not have a vapor barrier. Um, can be left uh, exposed and where codes permit and is, is more generally tailored to um, 
customer base that uh, doesn't want to have um, any sort of uh, you know itchiness that, that can come along with fiberglass. Um, again, available in all the R values and and widths uh, for for any application. Cavity shields. So this is primarily used for multifamily construction. Um, it is essentially the same fiberglass bat as our unfaced offering that we showed on the first slide. Um, it does not have the R value uh, associated with it on the bag. Uh, it does have the same thermal and sound properties as, as any of the standard fiberglass applications, um, but it's primarily used for, um, you know, keeping um, sprinklers uh, or eliminating the sprinkler need between floors and then um, for sound purposes. From a spec compliance perspective, um, you know, I don't need to go too far into the weeds on this. Most of this, all of this information is available on our website, but uh, all of our fiberglass products are designed to meet um, the ASTM C665 uh, specification, and um, that's, I'll kind of just leave it at that. 2550 is your main uh, criteria for whether you can have something exposed or not for flame spread and smoke develop, but all of this information is available on our website. Insula Shield is a product that we use primarily for theater applications in the commercial space, um, but uh, there are a few other smaller applications that it can be used for. It's available in unfaced. Um, generally, they're, they're stacking layers of this product, and then the, the most outer face would have a black uh, mat on it, or FSK or PSK, so it is available in, in several different forms and also rolled form for that, for that top layer, but generally it's a, it's a theater application thing, but it can be used in other areas as well. And with that, I will turn it over to Mr. Dake. Thank you, Brian. So moving into our other fiberglass product line, we'll talk about blown-in fiberglass. So blown-in fiberglass is really the same material that Brian just discussed on all of his different product offerings. Uh, just with the exclusion, it does not have any binder or glue to it. Uh, so the end result is the image you see on the slide here where you have loose fibers instead of the nicely formed bats and rolls of product, Brian's product lines. This material is loaded into a machine, a machine that can range in size from a small machine that you would rent from a local Lowe's or Home Depot, for example, that would fit in the back of your SUV all the way up to a much larger machine that's mounted to a box truck uh, where folks who do this all day, every day, would take that to multiple jobs. Uh, our two main product lines here are Climate Pro and Attic Protector. Climate Pro is our product that is geared more toward the professional, so the guy using a larger box truck type of machine. And our Attic Protector is what you'll find at your local DIY store. Uh, this is routinely used in attic applications. So somebody would be loading the hopper at one end, and then you have another operator holding the hose up in the attic space, filling that, uh, that space. Uh, but it can also be used in a wall application where you put a uh, netted fabric over open cavities and typically a new construction. Uh, the hose can go into that netting and fill the cavity uh, so you get a really nice uh, finish uh, insulation, but it, more times than not, uh, loose fill fiberglass is going in an attic application. It will be installed to a given thickness for each R value. So for uh, on every bag, there's a coverage chart that lists various R values, and to achieve those R values, you just have to hit uh, the given uh, amount of area and the given amount of thickness to get to that R value. The biggest competitor to blown-in fiberglass is cellulose. Uh, cellulose is typically recycled paper uh, that would be installed a similar way to what I was just describing. Uh, Climate Pro and fiberglass in general has many advantages over cellulose, just to highlight a few. Uh, cellulose is going to be naturally uh, combustible. It's paper. It's a, it's a wood product. Uh, fiberglass is naturally fire-resistant. So to combat that, cellulose needs to be treated with various chemicals so that it can be applied in people's homes. Uh, another thing to look out for is the amount of coverage you get per bag. We don't discuss pricing on these webinars, but 
Uh, it's important to pay attention if you see a much lower price point, you need to pay attention to how much coverage or square footage you are going to get out of that bag. Typically, fiberglass compacts much easier and then fluffs up during the installation process in that machine uh, much more than cellulose will. Uh, so fiberglass bags typically cover a significantly more uh, amount of area uh, than a typical cellulose bag will. And another fiberglass loose fill product that we offer is our Spider Plus. Uh, I would encourage you to go on to JM.com or look on YouTube for JM Spider Plus to look at some videos. It's really a neat application. You get a flavor for that on the images here. It uh, is sprayed in much similar to what our Climate Pro or Attic Protector would be uh, with the addition of a fine mist of water. You can kind of see that uh, specialty nozzle in the image on the screen here. Uh, that fine mist of water enables the product to lock into that cavity. And when you scrub off the excess blow, uh, as you can see on the upper right image, you get a very nice, clean, finished product. Uh, and it's a really one of the more innovative products that JM has to offer. So I would encourage you to look at uh, some more images online if you're curious about Spider Plus. So moving into our mineral wool product line, uh, so despite both being having wool in the name, uh, they really are much different blowing wool and mineral wool. Uh, unlike our fiberglass products, which are made of molten glass, which is then fiberized, mineral wool is made of molten rock, which is then fiberized. So we essentially have a, a homemade volcano, if you will, at our lone producing plant, which is in Phoenix City, Alabama, uh, where we melt rock and fiberize it and form it into a, a bat that looks very similar to what you would see with fiberglass. While there's a lot of information out there, uh, marketing materials and such, that promote mineral wool as being a superior uh, sound attenuation product, uh, so while it does do a very good job uh, at handling sound applications, really the sweet spot for mineral wool it comes down to fire. Because it's made of ro molten rock, it has a much higher melting point than fiberglass does. So typically when you're using mineral wool, the main reason is fire. That's really the main takeaway I'd like you guys to take from this presentation, is that mineral wool equals fire. So getting into a couple of the applications, uh, some of our residential products, we have our temp control product. Uh, this is where R value would matter in a residential application. So you can see we have R15, R23, and R30 offerings. And this would be installed most typically on the exterior walls of a single family home uh, where uh, thermal properties are what you are trying to achieve. Moving into the inside of the home, we have our sound and fire block. Uh, this is going to go in the interior walls of your home or in between the floor and ceiling spaces of a multi-level home. Uh, so again, Mineral Wool does a tremendous job at sound attenuation, uh, but the reality is as long as you've been properly installed both a Mineral Wool and a fiberglass product, uh, fiberglass is really going to perform the same from a sound perspective as mineral wool does. Uh, the human ear cannot detect a difference between the two, so it's really about fire. So if you're going to install this product in your home, it's really about slowing the spread of fire from room to room and floor to floor in case of a fire event. And similar to what Brian showed, we have all the appropriate specifications, testing, certifications, and whatnot. Uh, I would just, con just consult jm.com for more information on that. So because of mineral wool fire properties, mineral wool is most typically used in commercial spaces. While it does get installed in single family homes often, uh, a vast majority of the mineral wool uh, in North America gets installed in commercial applications. Uh, the most high demand product that we have is our Minwool SAFB or our sound attenuation fire bat. Uh, that's very similar to the sound and fire block product I showed earlier for residential. This is the commercial version. Uh, so this is typically in 16 and 24 inch widths to fit those steel studs that Brian had showed in an earlier slide. And again, this would go uh, in interior partition walls uh, in large commercial buildings. Uh, and in between the floor and ceiling spaces in commercial construction. 
And just like all of our products, they're available in a wide variety of thicknesses and widths. Um, so consult uh, your customer service advocate for more information on that. One of the biggest advantages you get with Johns Manville SAFB is our compression packaging. We are able to put a lot more material in a bag, which means we get a lot more material on every truck. Uh, that has many advantages, uh, including using less space in a customer's facility, job site, our own warehouses. Uh, it gets more material on a truck, so you have fewer shipments going across the country. It means fewer trips to a job site from a distributor or a contractor. Uh, it means less waste on a job site, less packaging to deal with, and fewer bags to move around between floors and rooms on a construction site. So just a few examples to highlight with Johns Manville versus the competition here. So as you can see, depending on the SKU, Johns Manville has a significant advantage in terms of how much we can get how many square feet we can get on a truck or in a certain amount of warehouse space, uh, which is really critical, especially in today's environment with increasing transportation costs and the like. Uh, it really is an advantage uh, that Johns Manville has. So moving away from the interior of the building to the exterior of the building, uh, we have our curtain wall material. Uh, this is typically used in uh, commercial high-rise construction uh, often would be found behind glass on uh, large high-rise buildings, things of that nature. It's available in our both our four and eight pound densities. It's our curtain wall 40 and curtain wall 80 product lines. And again, available in a wide variety of uh, thicknesses and widths. This is also available in a faced and unfaced version, which you can see on the image on the slide. Staying on the outside of the building, we have a more niche product of our Minwool window wall uh, with a slightly different construction and application, uh, and it is available in a 3.5 PCF density. Again, on the outside of the building is our safing material. Uh, I draw your attention to the image on the right. That yellow area is the safing. Uh, despite the image uh, there, it comes in a 24 by 48 inch bat, and it is then cut into a strip that you would see in that image there. Uh, what that image is showing you, that semicircle is uh, depicting the edge of a cement slab floor, and to the left you see the exterior cladding, which could be stone or uh, glass or anything of that nature. Typically, there's going to be a gap between that slab and the exterior cladding. Uh, in order to resist flame spread from floor to floor, that space needs to be treated, and most typically that's going to be done by stuffing mineral safing in that gap. And again, on the outside of the building, our last product offering uh, in mineral wool is our JM Cladstone. This is meant to be used in rain screen applications. So it is meant to be exposed to some degree of moisture. A lot of rain screen applications and um, cladding systems are designed to allow moisture into that cavity. Uh, so cladstone is designed to be more water repellent. Mineral wool in general is naturally water repellent. I mean, if you think about it, it's molten rock. Rocks are naturally water repellent, but cladstone just adds to that feature. Um, by having some more properties, that makes it even more so. Uh, we have four different density offerings, Cladstone 45, 60, 80, and 110. And as you can see on the screen, those are labeled as such because of the densities of each of those products. And again, um, all the specifications, uh, and, you know, we're very competitive. We meet all of the appropriate ASTM standards, testing, certifications, and the like. And the last product line I will talk to you about is polyiso. So polyiso is a rigid foam board insulation. Uh, it has the highest R value of any other foam board insulation, as you can see on the screen. So it's extremely thermally efficient, and it can also act as your air and weather barrier all in one if you treat the seams and the penetrations uh, with tape to act as that barrier. So it's a very good advantage for somebody installing. You have the potential to eliminate that independent uh, weather-resistant barrier, uh, a Tyvek, if you will, 
uh, so a definite advantage with polyiso. The reasons one would install polyiso most typically on the outside of a building is to achieve continuous insulation. I won't get into too many of the details of continuous insulation here, but just a brief overview of that. Continuous insulation is a blanket of material that is meant to be wrapped around the outside of the building. I'm advancing to the slide here to give you a, a visual of that. So as codes continue to increase, uh, the interior cavity only has a limited amount of space typically. We've moved to more two by six construction. Sometimes you can get a little bit thicker than that. But in the end, you only have so much room on the inside of the building to achieve code. So as code requirements increase, uh, we're left with finding a place to add more insulation on the exterior of a building. And the easiest way to do that is to go on the outside of the building. So on the image you can see here, you have the interior cavity, uh, which is highlighted here in yellow. And you can see the studs depicted here, right? So every one of those studs is an opportunity for you to lose your conditioned air from the inside to the outside uh, with a steel stud that's even more magnified than it would be with wood. Uh, and so you can insulate every aspect of your cavity, but you still have those studs that allow for that conditioned air to escape from the building. That's where continuous insulation comes in. So in the image here, you have this layer in between the exterior masonry and the inside of the building that wraps a blanket around the outside of the building that cuts off that thermal bridging or that loss of heat or cool from the inside of the building. Here, this is uh, a polyiso application. Uh, our JM Cladstone mineral wool could also be this layer here and could also accomplish continuous insulation. We have a new resource on JM.com all about continuous insulation. This is really one of the biggest trends in building insulation today, and we don't see that going away anytime soon. Again, uh, you know, code requirements continue to increase. Typically, those only become more and more rigorous as time goes on. So continuous insulation is going to play a role in the future of insulation. So our mineral wool and polyiso, as well as spray foam, which Tom will talk about later, all can help you achieve continuous insulation on your building. Our biggest product line in the polyiso world is our AP foil continuous insulation, which you can see in the images to the right. Uh, it comes with a silver foil face on one side and a more opaque or white unprinted side for different applications. Different sides can be exposed, uh, exposed to the exterior of the building. Uh, AP foil is does require to be covered up. So it needs to be covered up with drywall or an exterior cladding uh, for fire purposes. And again, this is typically a four by eight sheet of material, uh, but various thicknesses and sizes are available uh, on a custom basis. And our last offering is our CI Max continuous insulation. This is meant to be left exposed. It's a little hard to see on the image here on the right, uh, those are two different, uh, our foil version as well as our white face version. There's a little bit of texture on those facers. They're more robust than our AP foil. So those are meant to be left exposed to the interior. So typically you're going to see this in warehouses or in residential basement applications. That textured finish gives a nice finished look when used with our white tape. Uh, so you get a really nice finished product that's meant to be left exposed. And again, our specification compliance, which please go to jm.com if you need more information there. And that's it with my product line. So with that, I will hand it over to Tom. Thank you, Eric. I appreciate it. Hey, just for a light recap for everybody on the phone, all of JM's fiberglass, mineral wool, and polyiso board insulation products are manufactured by JM. Spray foam insulation is the only insulation product that Johns Manville does not manufacture. See, JM provides the chemicals for spray foam to a contractor who went out and they purchased a mobile spray foam insulation manufacturing plant. They will take the chemicals and manufacture and apply the spray, uh, spray foam insulation to a, a building or into a house and they do that in compliance with the JM technical 
attributes for these products. So I just want to make something clear that that's a big difference than most of all the other products that we have. When we take a look at spray foam, when we look at the closed cell, it has one of the highest R values per inch than any insulation in the marketplace. It's seven per inch. It provides superior thermal energy efficiency, especially in the colder climates when we go from anywhere from minus 30 degrees Fahrenheit to 80 degrees Fahrenheit within a year. It has advanced air control, and this is both open and closed cell. And the open cell has advanced sound control problems properties because it's like fiberglass it absorbs sounds and if we kind of take a look at everything that we have here that closed cell is also highly resistant to floodwaters and damage per FEMA out there so when we take a look at spray foam because it can be manufactured in the field custom manufactured for each one of the cavities that it's going into it provides air and also R value for all those cavities. And if you're using closed cell sp spray foam and it's more than an inch and a half thick, you also get vapor retarder. So going to the kind of the way of this looks, if you look to the, the right of the screen there, open cell is just open with cells. And then the closed cells, as you can see, are really tightly dense packed and they contain a gas that gives them the higher R value. So open cell can be used in Residential, mostly it's all above grades, roof lines, attics, walls, and soundproofing, where closed cell can be used commercially, residentially, industrial. It can be used on metal buildings and pole barns, attics, crawl space, basements, and is typically used for continuous insulation on the exterior of buildings. The difference between the two is that the open cell is very light. It's, it's about five pounds per cubic foot, so it's very soft, and you can actually just put your finger right through it where closed cell foam is very dense, then if you put your finger on it, it would be hard and you could almost feel it knock. When you're creating this, the open cell expands 100 times its initial volume, where closed cell, it's only 25. The blowing agent for open cell, pretty basic, it's water. But now we look to closed cell, and again, this is where we get that higher R value, it is either gonna be an H FC or an HFO, and I'll get into that in a little bit more. It's just different type of blowing agents out of there. And so each one of these have their own physical properties out there that provide air barrier, moisture, and different types of consistencies. Typically how this falls in the United States is that open cell is used in below the Mason-Dixon line and closed cell is used above the Mason-Dixon line. And this is really driven again by the delta between the coldest temperatures in the year and the warmest temperatures. The bigger swing that you have, the more insulation you're gonna to wanna to have in the wall. And that's why you move to closed cell up north because you have a lot smaller, thinner footprint than you would if you had to use open cell. These products can be used, like I said, on an ent entire building, up in the attics, on the interiors, and also in the crawl space and the exteriors in the basement. JM Corbon 3 is our premium product and it's been around for a very long time. This is a closed cell foam, which is two pounds per cubic foot density and has a high yield, about 5,100 board feet per 55 gallon set of materials. It has an R value of seven per inch and that's for every single inch going upwards. Some of our competition, once we start getting over two, three inches, they lose their initial R value and it starts decreasing. Ours does not. We have air barrier approval from ABAA at one inch and we're a vapor retarder at 1.5 inches. You can actually install this stuff with a maximum lift at four inches without having a problem. But what we recommend is multiple passes at 1.5, which you can do one right after the other. And that gives a better structure and a better foam going into the walls. The neat thing about this product, if you have the winter formula out there, you can spray it as low as 20 degrees Fahrenheit and 70 degrees Fahrenheit. And then in the summertime, we move it up so you get similar yields from 45 to 120. Moving in now into Corbon 4, this is our new product, which has an HFO blowing agent, which meets the new environmental codes out there for low global warming potential product. It has 
Um, zero, zero free ion, freons, just like core bond three, but it has a little bit lower global warming potential. So it's uh, more environmentally friendly out there. And about 18 states have adopted the use of this new product. And it has the same attributes we have with core bond three, except it has a different blowing agent. And the only real kind of significant difference on this with the, the blowing agent, we don't see as high a yield as we did with our Corbon 3. When I talk about 5,100 board feet with Corbon 3, with Corbon 4, we're looking, we're anywhere between 48 to 4,900, but against our competition, it's still close to three to 500 more board foot per set than our competition. Moving now on to our Corbon open cell spray foam. Again, this is a, a half pound density foam. It has an air barrier of 3.75 per inch. Again, with an open cell foam, you don't get that R value you get with closed cell. The R value here is 3.8 inches, and our standard product here gets anywhere between 16,500 to 18,000 board feet per set. When I say a set, it's a 55 gallon drums, so you'd have A and B. Our brand new product that we just launched this year is our high yield open cell product. Again, this is similar to the other one, except that this one is pushing close to 19,000 board feet per set. And it has the same attributes as we have with our open cell product. Uh, you just, you're getting more footage out of the, the product than our standard clo closed cell product. So that's kind of the gist of our spray foam products. What I'd like to do right now, I'm gonna jump into a, a really exciting product. It's called GoBoard. GoBoard, is a lightweight tile backer board. And if you think about if you're a tiler, everything in your life is heavy. The tiles are heavy, the grout is heavy, the, the backer boards are heavy. Well, we introduced something that's revolutionary and it's gonna add another 20 years to a tiler's life. It's called Gold Board. It's a light density polyiso foam board that can be cut with an X-Acto knife and there's no dust associated with this. So when you're looking at carrying something in, typically, you know, a regular uh, tile backer board probably weighs about 35 pounds. This one's five pounds. You can carry them all up in one time where you'd have to take separate trips with all the other products that you have out there. In addition to that lightweight board that we have out there, we also have all the parts for a shower kit to make it easily to be installed. And one thing to note on it is the fabric that we use on it you don't have to put a water repellent on it. It's water resistant. So after you fasten it down, you just have to touch up the screws that you put in, but that's it. So it is so easy to use. It's lightweight and it's a really dynamic product that we came to market with. So changing gears and kind of bring it all home right now, I wanna talk about something that really helps out for everybody who's in the marketplace who are installing our products. It's called Tech, Tech Connect. All the products that I've talked about today in insulation, they work. They work when you put them in and they'll last for the life of the building, which could be a hundred years. The area where they don't work is if they're improperly installed. So as a manufacturer, we have free training and this training is online, it's on call and it's on site. If you're installing and buying John's Manville products, we will come out there and work with your team, teams to make sure that they're doing it right every single time. So this would be the field organization and we touch on everything from the thermals and acoustics to the installment recommendations. When we work with um, the installers to make sure that they have the right temperatures and settings with spray foam, because that's probably the most intricate product that we have. But when we also look at spider, Plus out there, we can come out and teach the guys the right techniques so they can install it right every single time. In addition to the field technical organization, we also have JM specified services. And this is really focused at getting JM products into specifications and going out there and training your customers on the value of insulation and the way that we are as a corporation teaching the people who are out there to do it right every single time and what those benefits are. So any type of technical support you need on that end, we're there to help you. With regards to Tech, Tech Connect, we also have a spray foam parts and equipment distribution. And basically what this is, is when we're out in the field and we're working with the guys on the spray foam rig, and if they have any broken parts on the machinery, we can get that to them right away. 
And we're just not there shuffling parts around. The guy who handles this program is a field technical service representative and he knows the equipment inside and out. So when people call in, he, we really talk with them to diagnose what the real root cause analysis is because we wanna send you the right parts the first time and not have to keep sending you things trying to make it work. So we troubleshoot with you right on the phone. We'll use FaceTime to make this all work. So with that, what I'd like to do is turn this back over to Rachel to, to bring us home. Thank you so very much. Thanks so much, Tom. Before we get to some questions, I do wanna go over a few resources that we have available. Um, the first one I'd like to highlight is the source, and it is your access to all things Installation Intel. You can access previously recorded webinars and trainings, as well as educational pieces like our white paper and blogs. You can access this on jm.com slash the source. And again, this is a great resource for anyone looking for more educational pieces. And as Tom mentioned, we have Tech Connect um, as a, another great resource. The Tech Connect team is available to all JM customers online, on site, and on call. These experts are here to help with anything John's Mailville products, including installation, troubleshooting, parts and equipment, or even specifying questions. And then finally, we have the certificate of completion. Everyone who attended today will get a certificate delivered to their inbox next week. And you can use this to submit for additional continuous um, education learning credit. So that wraps up the available resources. Tom, Eric, and Brian, let's jump into some questions. Um, the first question is for Brian. Um, what material is used in fiberglass insulation? Sure. Um, so essentially you're melting sand and uh, some various other you know, proprietary pieces that most manufacturers have, um, millions of pounds of post-consumer recycled glass bottles, and then uh, you're spraying a thermosetting resin on it and curing it uh, through an oven. So primarily it's sand and recycled glass from, uh, from the industry. Great, thank you, Brian. Um, Eric, would you be able to describe how this product, um, the material is different than the material used in mineral wool? Sure, uh, so as I discussed in the presentation, uh, you know, mineral wool is made out of rock. Uh, specifically, basalt is the main rock that is used, along with limestone and dolomite, and coke, which is a fancy word for coal, uh, large chunks of that to keep the heat in the furnace. And then similar to Brian's process, it gets a, a binder applied to it uh, from there. Great, thank you so much. The next question is for Brian. What insulation do you recommend to minimize sound transmission? Uh, well, you, know, you, you could use any, uh, any of our fiberglass, mineral wool, or even, even foam-based products. So I guess it really depends on uh, the amount of STC you're going after. So STC, your sound transmission coefficient, um, for example, uh, an uninsulated uh, wall with just studs and drywall is going to give you about 30. Um, and then as you add insulation to it, you can achieve, uh, you know, upwards of, of 50, depending on, on, on the construction application. So um, it really depends on how much you're after um, and, and what codes might require. Thanks, Brian. As a, a follow-up question, um, do you have any products that you recommend to meet high STC requirements? Yeah, I mean, uh, <laughs> there's a couple different ways to uh, to go about that. Um, so, you know, if you're uh, depending on the construction process, if it's if it's staggered studs and and double wall or multifamily construction, um, you know, any of the fiberglass products we offer are gonna are gonna probably be your best bet there. Um, if you have the availability of, of creating a, you know, a full wall system um, and adding some foam to it, uh, it's only going to help your cause. Um, spray foam, you know, standalone is probably one of the best. Great. Thank you so much. Um, the next question is for Eric. What insulation product do you recommend for below grade? 
So most typically, uh, if we're talking below grade on the outside of a foundation, AP foil is a, is a great use uh, in that application. Uh, more times than not, you're not going to see our fibrous uh, products installed in that fashion. Uh, certainly, you see them on the interior of a, in a basement and things like that, but typically below grade on the outside of a foundation, uh, AP foil uh, is going to be the most common JM product for that application. Great. Thank you so much. Speaking of AP foil, what are some key best practices for ex um, installing AP foil on exterior, exterior metal studs? So, you know, key best practices, uh, you know, certainly uh, consult jam.com for our uh, install instructions uh, regarding fastener spacing, things of that nature, making sure you're hitting the studs. Uh, but more broadly, I guess I would recommend uh, using the JM wall system. That is a, a patented wall system that we have. Uh, if you remember back to uh, my slide where the, the diagram uh, showed the interior cavity and then that outside uh, masonry brick with uh, the AP foil there as a continuous insulation. Uh, you know, applying that with uh, tape on the, all of the seams and all of the penetrations uh, allows you to get rid of an independent WRB. So, uh, you're saving time and money by eliminating that step. So I would say that'd probably be my, my recommendation for that. Thanks, Eric. Um, the next question is for Tom. Um, Tom, would you, um, this person's wondering if our Corbron products have any like flex to it, like if it's um, capable of movement. Our Corbon products, so when, when they spray the Corbon in there, and with it, it will stick and stay in place, and it shouldn't crack or move. However, people do run into problems if they apply the material and the substrate isn't dry, clean, and sound, and it needs to be at the right temperature when the product is sprayed. So we do have a number of applications where somebody will spray the material, and let's say on a, a metal purlin, et cetera, and it had oil on it. The, the, the polyiso will not stick to that and it will pull off. So the, the, the manufacturer and the applicator, the person who has the spray foam rig, their, their job is to make sure everything's clean, dry, and sound before they apply it. Once it's applied, it should be able to stay in place for the life of the building. And again, with the right product, with a closed cell foam like Corbon 3 or Corbon 4, that should be able to go to you know you know minus 50 all the way all the way up to 120 degrees without any pulling away from the studs. Great, thank you so much, Tom. Um, the next question is for Brian. Um, this person during the presentation um, commented that they noticed that the available bat insulation R values did not include R38 and wanted to ask um, why is that. Um, sure. So on the, the the most popular fiberglass products in North America, unfaced and craft faced, uh, both go all the way up to R49. So um, those two slides did did indicate that, um, but that uh, you know they they go all the way up to R49. So their R38 is is in there, and then also the R38 cathedral ceiling, which is just a more dense product for uh, for a cathedral type application. But it goes all the way up to 49. Great, thank you so much. The next question is for Tom. Um, how does polyiso reach class one vapor retarder standards while closed cell only meets class two? Pretty simple. On all of our board products, we have a, a bilaminate or a trilaminate foil facing, and that's what produces, uh, creates it to be a, a type one. Great, thank you. Um, the next question, um, I believe is for you, Tom. Could you describe the difference between an ignition barrier and a thermal barrier? Yes, uh, a thermal barrier is gonna give you a 15 minute rating, which basically is saying that, look, that you got 15 minutes to get out of the house and be safe. And a thermal barrier would be something like drywall. That, that would definitely have 15 minutes. There are some actual coatings that you need to apply and you'd have to go to our code compliance report 
to see what thicknesses and what types of coatings need to be put on our foam to give you that 15 minute uh, thermal barrier. Now, a an niction an barrier is not as thick and not as demanding and only gives you five minutes. And again, there are special coatings for that and that can be found on our code comp compliance report. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, the next question is for Eric. Um, is there a suggestion for water resistant insulation products? So the two that come to mind um, from my product lines would be our AP foil, again, uh, especially when treated with uh, tape on all of your seams and fasteners, uh, as well as our JM Cladstone, or really mineral wool in general, uh, depending on the degree of which uh, you need your water repellency. Again, rock is naturally going to be hydrophobic, so mineral wools uh, typically used uh, for moisture prevention. Uh, but more specifically, our JM Cladstone uh, is uh, specifically designed uh, to repel water. Great, so thank with you. The, the, um, okay. Just real quick, so with the closed cell spray foam, it's a vapor uh, retarder at 1.5 inches, so that would work also. Thank you so much. And we did receive a question about um, coverage charts for attic protector. I'm going to send in the chat a link to our document library. You're able to access all of our coverage charts, data sheets, um, and all content for each product. So I just sent that out in the chart, uh, or sorry, in the chat, excuse me. Um, and then the next question is for Tom. Um, are you able to uh, leave spray foam um, exposed after it's been installed? Okay, so then the question would be is really no, and it depends and, and, and there's an, a, we have appendix X approvals that would allow the, the product to be left exposed under certain engineering applications where there is a, like if you sprayed an attic and you're not, you just go up there to do some maintenance, but you're not storing anything up there and you have a special lid that allows you in and out because if there's a fire out there it would snuff out the fire that could be left exposed and those are what they call appendix of x approval type insulation and we both have that on our open and closed cell but if you were just going to spray walls and ceilings and have people around that you need to make sure that you have a 15 minute thermal barrier over the top of this product because all foam products, as you know, burn and they burn very quickly. So you have to be very careful. But determining if it's gonna be a thermal barrier or ignition barrier, that is really left up to the authority who has jurisdiction over that area. And that would be the code officials in that area or the, the, uh, the architect specifying the system. Great, thank you so much. Um, the next question is for Eric. Does a contractor need to be certified to install Spider Plus? No, they don't. Um, it, spider is much different than, you know, an example that comes to mind is spray foam, right, which requires more rigorous training and certifications and things of that nature. Uh, spider is much more simple than that. Uh, you really just have a hose with fiberglass and then the mist of water. Uh, somebody could watch some of in our instructional videos and get up to speed pretty quickly. Uh, so because of that, uh, there is not a certification process uh, for our spider product. Great, thank you so much. Um, and then the last question is for Brian. Brian, is there a difference in acoustic properties between fiberglass and mineral wool? Um, while there may be some slight number differentials to them, um, like Eric had mentioned pre previously, there it, it's nothing noticeable to the to the naked ear, if you will. So both will suit your applications just fine and, and meet your specifications. And if that was our last question, I guess I have a I have a question for everybody that may or may not even have an answer. But um, what other manufacturer are you going to go buy your products from that actually makes fiberglass, mineral wool? Polyiso foam, spray foam, and go board. Uh, 
Great question, Brian. And with that, we are able to do, um, I, like you said, a variety of offerings and um, shipments. And if you guys have any questions, you're welcome to talk to your um, JM representative. Um, and I'd like to thank everyone for attending our webinar today. Uh, thank you, Tom, Brian, and Eric for presenting. Um, and we appreciate you guys joining us and um, asking these great questions. And with that, we'll end our webinar and I hope you have a great day.